All right, uh, so we've heard a lot about PC Archive, but I wanted to give uh, kind of like a brief overview of its uh, architecture and how it works and some of its use cases and goals. Um, as mentioned, I'm actually a multi software scientist, so PC Archive is a multi project. Um, Open Force Field is sponsoring um, a lot of features within it, like conversion drives and sequence chain optimizations and the like. Um, so really the, the overall design goal of this is um, you know, how can we kind of create and curate quantum chemistry data really at scale? Um, you know, uh, very similar to what Simon was talking about when I stopped caring about, um, you know, the exact input and output file and, you know, then parsing it all into some sort of CSV or something else. But can I just simply um, request computations at scale and have them come back in some sort of organized fashion? That's really what we're after. Um, of course, uh, if we just do this, we really want the ability to access data from anywhere on the globe, um, which means that we have central databases and we have clients that can pull them down. Um, and we'll also have some websites that we're spinning up too, so you can just simply um, go online and, and pull data chunks that you want using canonical web resources. Um, a couple other things to consider is that um, can we not just use one supercomputer at, at once, but can we use dozens or hundreds of supercomputers simultaneously to uh, compute with? Um, is also one of the other design goals because we really want to support um, large organizations like the Open Force Field, where we actually have managers. Um, that are running quantum chemistry computations um, at the different uh, facilities across the US. Um, and then really on the order that we're talking about is how do we not store tens or millions, but actually billions of quantum chemistry results. Um, the data involved is actually really quite trivial as long as you're not storing wave functions. Um, so being able to collate this kind of scale of data is really what we're after as well. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I think the, the other thing is really after kind of like removing this middleman kind of thing where um, there's no, uh, you know, I have a graduate student that tells me to do computations, he runs it on a supercomputer, he does everything, formats it, and then tries to give it back to me. Um, can we just skip all that? So can we just say at a very high level, go off and compute these things, and then have everyone in a single group or a single community able to access that data simultaneously? Um, on top of this, we try to uh, take quite a few really fun use cases. Um, open force field is one of them. So as mentioned, um, we want to do all these torsion drives. We want to do um, constrained geometry optimizations, partial charges, ESPs, weight functions, um, ground requests for just an incredible diverse amount of data from open force field, um, which is the kind of things that we're looking at storing and how we organize and correlate them together. Um, then uh, most quantum chemists will say like, you know, I want to search for like ammonia dimer or something like this. Um, but in the biomolecular space, of course, we really want to search based off smiles or energy. So it requires us to um, kind of revamp of how we well, how we can query data and how we can organize data as well. Um, so to date, I think these numbers have been um, shown that we've um, been computing quite a bit of data with this kind of framework. Um, right now, we're actually limited purely by core count. Um, and the neat thing is anyone here can actually contribute um, to these computations by spinning up managers locally. Um, it would be pretty trivial actually to recompute everything from a server side and pass throughput point of view in just a couple of days um, with a sufficient amount of parallelized cores. Um, so uh, if you ever want to contribute, um, get in touch and we'll show you how to spin up some managers and you just pull from our central view of that. Um, the other thing we look into a lot is how do we integrate with Jupyter Notebooks? Um, how do I visualize and get all the data kind of in a, in a Python and API sort of fashion? Um, and so this is what we're really focusing on uh, at the moment is can I pull all this data down? Um, I'm not going to have the time to show it because we're running a little bit behind, but you can actually get um, every single portion drive that open force field is run in about six lines of code. Um, so you install one thing and you just pull the data and it'll be right there for you that you can kind of explore um, kind of uh, as you wish. Uh, the other thing that we're working really hard on is doing web applications. So can I just simply go to a website um, and can I do some, some interesting things? So I think one would be um, example for open force field and just simply um, have a molecule goes in, use the open force field toolkit and returns you a parameterized molecule um, in a web application. Um, we're doing a lot in the machine learning space and kind of uh, data visualization space as well through web apps. Um, we've actually engaged um, a, a group that's at MULSI's level to do something that does something very similar to this to help us out. Um, so uh, not only um, through Jupyter Notebooks, but hopefully through web applications as well, you can browse this data. Um, so all I'm going to say is you can engage us in a huge variety of data, ways. So first of all, I'd really suggest you checking out and viewing our data. Um, also, as I mentioned, you can also help us compute this. So if you want to compute for open force field, that's great. If you want to compute for your uh, own use cases in an open fashion, we can support that as well. 
Um, so, so really um, kind of uh, look through these things and look at how you can engage with this project. Uh, I think the other interesting thing about this is we have to really be careful to delineate between what is QC archive, which is this main Moleskine instance that everyone can go to, and what is the infrastructure involved. Um, so a, a lot of the use cases that we've heard is like, not only can I run this at Molsky at scale, um, but how do I use this exact same architecture and actually run it um, on a local machine or behind a firewall? Um, so all of the software is completely open source. Um, everything that you can do um, at Molsky and every single computation that you can run, um, you can also run uh, on your own without our primary central, uh, primary central server. Um, and so what this means is that if I want to be able to do kind of like just code version scans, I can uh, go ahead and spin this up. Uh, on my local supercomputer, I can run um, the torsions in exactly the same fashion that Open Forge Steel is doing um, to get all these parameters um, uh, kind of like out of the box. Um, so, so completely open source off software stack. Um, the other thing that I think is really important to these data efforts is some sort of schema. So uh, effectively, can I come up with a canonical input and output format um, for all of the um, as it turns out, uh, quantum chemistry is very lucky compared to molecular mechanics. The kinds and diversity of inputs are actually much, much smaller in space than molecular mechanics. So this is um, a much more tangible and, and approachable project. Um, and the other thing that's nice about this is you, it'll automatically spit out all kinds of things like, um, you know, what are my charges, um, what are my um, bond orders, et cetera, without me having to go through and actually parse uh, quantum chemistry output. Um, part of this ecosystem is abstracting this away. Um, and finally, uh, we also have something called QC Engine, which um, getting a schema to actually work uh, and getting a lot of uh, quantum codes to actually pick it up is a very long process. Um, to shortcut that, we've actually wrote something called QC Engine, which wraps around um, all these different quantum codes or codes that act like quantum codes um, to be able to run these and get the schema input and output um, from these codes up front. Um, so what this means is if I want to run uh, force fields for something like RDKit or hopefully more like OpenMM pretty soon, um, I can do that uh, in this fashion, and I can run um, my higher level codes around this. So like my geometry optimizer, it takes this input output, um, so I can just kind of switch out different backends. And so if this is force field, if it's semi-empirical, um, you have torch and you have peers, if I want to do machine learned force field, or if I want to do quantum mechanics, um, it's really all a matter of just switching out a couple of the lines and being able to um, extract this from the backend. Um, and so what this also means is that um, the even higher level things, so I have a torsion drive which requires um, an optimization program which requires some sort of backend, I can kind of mix and match it as I want. Um, so if I want to rerun all these torsion drives with something like Torchani, it's actually a matter of just switching out a couple things and applying to compute. Um, so it makes it very easy, uh, very easy to have this very composable ecosystem. Um, I think as Simon pointed out, kind of like this client-server compute architecture is becoming really popular. Um, this is something that um, we follow as well. Uh, you have central servers, you hook compute up to them, um, and then you can have third-party uh, clients, or you can just kind of engage our REST uh, APIs directly, depending on how you how you want to access um, all the data. Um, with our with our API clients, you have lots of things of how do you uh, have these reproducible pipelines, such as a torsion drive. Um, torsion drives actually contain every single piece of input information in them, um, along with every single piece of output information. So you can actually go back and reproduce any of these as you want. Um, or I think more important than simple reproducibility is the ability to tweak things. Um, so if I want to go back and I look at a torsion drive that was already run, I want to change a couple little parameters. Um, that's just a matter of changing a couple of dictionaries at a higher level and then rerunning the entire procedure. Um, the other thing that we do is how do we collect um, tons of a million and millions of computations in some, some sort of sane fashion. Um, so we have these things called collections, which are kind of like these flexible ways of looking at and organizing data. Um, so for example, one of them is called a torsion drive data set, which unsurprisingly organizes um, thousands or millions of torsion drives in some sort of um, smiles to torsion drive sort of fashion. So I can always go back and say, hey, was this um, torsion drive ever run? And I can automatically get the data. Um, so, so very flexible layers, and we can talk plenty more about that. Um, for distributed computes, uh, I, I think this is one thing that um, where we can actually take in uh, lots of uh, other um, um, programs and computations. Uh, we, we can um, effectively uh, have the central server uh, with like a central um, compute queue, and then we can spin up what we call managers on arbitrary physical resources um, as long as they're connected to the internet, um, that can actually pull down and execute um, various tasks on different supercomputers simultaneously. Um, as Simon points out, there's Dask and Dask Job Queue. Um, there's also um, 
ones that uh, are much more made for Exceed and um, leadership class supercomputers like Radical and Parcel, um, which allow us, for example, to scale up to Theta. I think we did 150,000 cores there. Um, simultaneously, we were connected to about a dozen other supercomputers, and it just all kind of worked. Um, so, so lots of fun that you can do with these, and we're actually not compute bound um, at all. It's just a matter of how can we get enough cores to actually feed this kind of thing. Um, uh, again, as mentioned, uh, I think this is really important to note is that MULSI has this main PC archive server, but all the software is completely open. Um, you can spin this kind of infrastructure up on your local computers, but doesn't talk to us at all. Um, or if you want in the future and you want to actually give us data, everything's in the same format, so it makes it incredibly easy to push it out um, to serve as kind of like a data resource uh, for the entire community. Um, I just want to point out that um, kind of like our mission is sort of like this grassroots approach where we work with a ton of CMS and community codes. Um, we have all these kinds of different software layers that go into um, additional downstream codes. Um, so we have like things like Engine that are being picked up by lots of uh, com uh, compute requirements in the community. Um, we use tons of cyber infrastructure from the NSF. Um, private databases are of course supported. Um, I think this is very important. Um, we also have our community database for all this kind of like open data that anyone can access. Um, we use tons and tons of technology from the community again to visualize and plot this kind of data. Um, and then finally, we're going all the way up and we're looking at kind of like gateways to portals um, for this data. And can we work with say journals um, or other large projects like us, like the materials project to help kind of like build out these kind of local um, ecosystems of data. And uh, there's more people that are on the slide that have contributed to it. Um, so I'll simply say, basically, thank everyone here. I think probably at least half the people here have touched the project in one way or another. Um, and uh, get in touch if you, if you want to 